<laughs> so here we go. Um, this is a story called uh, San Francisco in the 60s, Jack Kerouac and me. Billy and I left Los Angeles together, winding our way up the coast, but the long days in the car had left him with little appetite for more. Once we hit San Francisco, we wired home for money and headed back to Chicago. I was alone with a car, a box of clothes, and a few bucks. It seemed okay somehow. I was 18. I thought I knew the streets, and I thought I knew the answers. And I guess in some sense, I didn't. San Francisco in 1960 was a different town. In a few years, the scene would change. Bars, coffee houses, and poetry giving way to acid hash and lovins. That's but right. collar beatnik culture replaced by long hair tie-dye with, with a, a blue collar beatnik culture replaced by long hair tie-dye and bell bottoms. But that hadn't happened yet. In those days, you could still park overnight on the streets near the Civic Center. So I'd head over there around 10, curl up in the back seat of my Plymouth, covered by piles of dirty clothes, sleeping the sleep of 18. In the morning, I stumbled out of the car and walked to the Greyhound Terminal on 7th near Market. The bathrooms were free, and among the travelers, I was anonymous. Face washed and hair combed, I walked us across the street to Foster's Cafeteria, grabbing a Chronicle along the way. I'd order an English muffin and coffee, covered with, cover the muffin with pats of butter and spoonfuls of raspberry jam, fill the coffee with cream and sugar, and open the paper, ready to feast on my breakfast. Even now, I can taste the pool butter, yellow, sweet, and salty, mixed up with the red of the jam. And even now, I will eat that meal again and be happy. While I ate, I checked the want ads, looking for something I could do. Mornings, I looked for work. Afternoons, I washed dishes in some joint for a meal and a few bucks. And in the evenings, I wandered market and the streets of the Tenderloin, staring into the bars and shop windows, looking at the people and wondering how it all worked. I was alone, but I didn't know how lonely. Nowadays, I can't imagine how I did it, but I did. I had a guide, though, for this rough life. Jack Kerouac's on the road. On the road. I read it in Chicago, sitting in an all-night coffee shop, and it took the top of my head off. This is what men did. They careened across the country in old cars, finding love and having adventures and feeling the sadness and the rush. It made me, it made so much more sense to living the same fucked up stupid life as everybody else. Neil Cassidy and Dean Moriarty were my role models. My tired old Plymouth was Neil's Hudson. And in my way, I was living in free as free and unfettered as my heroes had. Eventually, I got a job with the phone company. <laughs> Am I getting some feedback here? Not really. Okay. Eventually, I got a job with the phone company. In the morning, I walked up Powell to the exchange, happy in the brisk air and bright sunshine, watching the shopkeepers hosing down the sidewalks. I was Dean working on the railroad, a blue-collar guy doing a working man's job. At the exchange, they put me on the frames. Anybody here ever work at the phone company? <laughs> no. At the exchange, they put me on the frames. I spent my days pulling orders, cryptic sets of numbers written on little slips of paper and directed me to rolls of tall panels filled with wires. I'd slide a rolling ladder to the right spot, then climb up till I made a, a node, or till I came to a node with numbers that matched the ones on the paper. And I either tied two new wires on or disconnected two old ones. Every once in a while, a voice would call out instructions over a big brown loudspeaker in the corner of the room. It was a new world for me, grown up and fulfilling. I must have borrowed some money from my mother before I got the job going, because I moved into the Crane Hotel on Powell Street, just a few blocks up from Market. I know that because I have a letter I wrote to her on July 14, 1960. In it, I say... The big problem facing me is, shall I pay another week's rent, $15, which would leave me about $5 for food? Two, look for a cheaper room, 8 to $10, which would leave me that much more for food. Three, move in with Tom and his aunt, saving money, but not something I want to do. Four, go back to sleeping in the car and cleaning up at the Greyhound Terminal. An altogether unsatisfactory process. Or five, come back to Chicago no better off than when I left. This one really doesn't appeal to me at all, since I almost have a job, and it's so nice here. 
Once I was working, I moved into the penthouse at the crane, a large top floor room with old furniture painted spray can gold. I started eating regularly. But my wife tells me, at the beginning of every good story, someone makes a bad choice. <laughs> and I guess I wanted to be in a good story. Yeah. Larry Brody and Bill Day, guys from my corner in Chicago, guys I had some history, history with, showed up. They had been making their way west from Chicago, breaking into laundromat coin changers, stealing credit cards from unlocked cars, leaving a trail of larceny in their wake. After a week in San Francisco, Bill had had enough and hit the road back to Chicago. That left Larry and me, and then Larry needed a partner. He convinced me that life in L.A. could be even better than life in San Francisco. So I quit my job, and we hit the road, headed to L.A., and trouble.